entitled Amazing Grace. We've heard the song, even our president tried to sing it recently. It's, you hear it at funerals, you hear it with the bagpipes and so on. People don't realize what that song is really all about. It's a testimony of a man named John Newton in the 1800s who was a slave ship captain, a drunkard, a murderer, because as you, if you've studied the history of slavery, when slaves were, were bought in Africa and had to go to other places, if, the, if you were stopped on the high seas by a military vessel who could arrest you for slavery, they would toss the slaves overboard. So he was a murderer as well. But one day, in the middle of a storm, a tempest, he had tied himself to the mast of his ship because if not, he would be washed overboard by the water. And you can imagine the scene, the water coming in, flooding the ship and hitting in the face, lightning coming down, and John Newton gave his heart to Christ. A lot of people didn't like that. Well, he should have been hung, right? But you know, God forgave him. He became a pastor in England. And later on, he was one of the chief witnesses against slavery, and the Parliament of Britain finally voted to do away with slavery. God is amazing. And that's why he wrote that song. The beautiful music, but the words are powerful. Amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. I was lost and now am found. Oh, hallelujah. That's a testimony, isn't it? You know, sometimes we have to go through a tempest, a storm or a hurricane in our lives before we realize that maybe we should come to Christ. Hallelujah. Amazing grace. One of the great aspects of God's love for us, each one of us, is called grace. G-R-A-C-E. Hmm? It's not just a lady's name. It is the undeserved, unmerited, unearned favor of God. It doesn't make any sense, does it? Why should God love me? Why should he favor me when I don't deserve it? And I certainly can't earn it. In the book of Ephesus, Paul explains how we can receive amazing grace from God. He starts by describing the people in the church, the believers, in the state they were in before they came under the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And some of them were even following the same ways of the world, even in church. Oh, my goodness. Our text is found in the book of Ephesians this morning in the second chapter. As you find it in your Bible, would you stand with me as we honor the Word of God? Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. You ready? And you hath he quickened. The word quickened in the old English means to make alive. And you he hath quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wow. God is telling us here through the, the writing of Paul in, Ephes in, in Ephesians that before we come to Christ, our body's alive, our soul is alive, our spirit is dead. And he's the only one that can bring it to life. Hmm. In trespasses and sins. Oh, we know about sins. What are trespasses? It's when you do something illegal. Now, what might that be? Maybe going through a red light, not stopping up a stop sign, offending someone and not even knowing it. Maybe when you pray, you ought to add that one on. Hmm? Trespasses. Listen to this. We're in in time or in the past... Ye walked according to the course of this world. You followed the crowd, did what they did, said what they did, went where they, where they were. According to the prince of the power of the air, the devil, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And we see that so much now in America, even in churches. The Episcopal Church recently voted to uh, go along with same-sex marriage. I sat next to an Episcopal preach, priest a couple of weeks ago, and I said, how in the world can you do that? Show me in the Bible where it says you can. He had no answer. Politically correct is not God's way of doing things. It's God correct. Hallelujah. 
Now look at this, look at this con congregation. Among whom also we all had our conversation, that's the word for lifestyle in modern English, in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, oh my goodness, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. You know our greatest battleground is the mind? Hmm? What's going on in your mind even right now? And were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, oh, when you see that term, but God in the Bible, be ready for a shock because it's going to change everything. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened made us alive together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That's a sermon in and of itself. You may be seated. Lord bless the reading of his word and bless the servants as he brings it forth. The word of God, if you continue to read this first chapter, the second chapter of Ephesus, it tells us we were gratifying, we were satisfying the cravings of our sinful nature. Hmm? Not just about eating, it's about other things too. Hmm? I was reading recently how women are closing the gap between men and in, in looking at pornography. Ouch. Okay. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, again, become children of wrath. But because of God's great mercy and love for us, which I don't understand. Do you? How could God love me? You can ask yourself the same question. God made us alive together with Christ and raised us up together to sit in heavenly places with Jesus Christ. You know, we may be here on earth, but we can be sitting spiritually in heaven with Jesus. The Bible talks about that. It is grace by which we've been saved. Hallelujah. Not anything else. It's not our money. It's not our service. It's not our family. It's not anything that we could give as an excuse or give God for salvation. We can't buy it. We can't earn it. And we don't deserve it. Are you awake this morning? Okay, good. It is by grace we've been saved. Mm. Heaven will be ours, not because of what we've done in this world, but because of the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Nothing else. Nothing else. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, what you have, what you don't have. It's only by the grace of God that we can be saved. Nothing else. In Ephesians, the second chapter, the seventh verse, it says, by, For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of ourselves. We can't do it. It is the gift of God. God gives gifts, you know. There's a lot of gifts in the Bible for his people. And he's not an Indian giver in the sense that he takes it back. He gives gifts. We, and we receive forgiveness through faith because of the grace of God. How could God forgive John Newton? How could he? Whether he liked it or not, he did. He forgave you and me. Oh, how, and some people don't like that either. But thank God that he is not a God who was trying to please people. He loves us. Oh, hallelujah. We had nothing to do with earning our salvation. All we need to do is to accept it. And that's all that Jesus is asking. Come. I'll forgive you. I'll give you a new life. I'll change the circumstances. I'll do this and I'll do that for you, but you have to accept it. Hmm. You know, a lot of people depend on religion. Religion says, do this, say this, give this. Or it has its nose. I grew up in a church where some of you Hispanic people can identify with this because it's the same thing. Women couldn't wear their hair long, couldn't cut it, couldn't dye it, couldn't wear makeup, could never come to church without having a dress on, probably all the way down to the floor. And men had other rules. Religion says, do it this way, and you'll be saved. Jesus said, it is done. 
at the cross, he did it all. You and I can't get saved by how we're dressed. Hmm? Or not. Hallelujah. Some of the women should be saying hallelujah. Change your hair color every month, right? <laughs> when Jesus shed his blood on Calvary, and we looked at that word last week, shed means to allow it to happen. He didn't spill his blood. He shed his blood. He was in control of everything. When he spled, shed his blood on the cross of Calvary, he said, it is finished. Not talking about dying. He was talking about what had to be done so you and I could be saved by grace. Oh, hallelujah. He didn't say to be continued. Come back next week for part two. It is finished. The Bible says once for all, he became the sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Mm -hmm. In Hebrews, this 12th chapter in the second verse for your notes, it says, it declares that Jesus Christ is the author and the finisher of our faith. Because of Jesus shed blood, that covenant that he made, he made a covenant with us. When he shed his blood on the cross, a vow that if we follow him, we will be saved, forgiven, and cleansed. Hallelujah. We are no longer under the old ritual law, but under grace. Romans 6, 14. You can read it for yourself. There are churches that still tell you, you have to do this to be forgiven. Do five good deeds. Say, repeat this 500 times. Whatever. Jesus never made those kind of rules. He just said, come to me the way you are. Hmm? The way you are. Hallelujah. Hebrews 8, 6, and 7 says that Jesus Christ provided us with a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Hallelujah. We should rejoice every day because we are delivered from guilt and shame and condemnation. So stop doing it to yourself. When you came to Christ, he delivered you from that. Take it out of your vocabulary. Stop talking about what you were and talk about who you're going to be. Hallelujah. Galatians 5.1 says, Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Many cases where slaves or prisoners have been freed, they've been in bondage so long, they'll pick up their chains and put them back on. And sometimes as Christians, we do that. Stop it. God has forgiven you and made you free. Made you free. It's all yours because of the grace of God. The grace of God. But many Christians even today have a wrong picture of God. Most religions have the wrong picture. We see our Father God as a harsh Father mm, who's ready to punish us every time we make the slightest mistake. He's ready to punish and destroy us. Mm? You see, that's what the law does when you follow the rituals, and that's all you follow. When we all are bound by laws, our focus is always on our sins and our failures. What did you do now? Oh, you failed again. You messed up again, right? Do this, do that. That's what the Israelites were involved in. You sinned, you had to sacrifice an animal. The blood was shed symbolically to cover the sins and so on and so on and so on. Over and over and over again. On the day of atonement in the temple, they sacrificed over a quarter of a million animals. One day. Did it change people? I doubt it. Because they had to do it every year, over and over again. But there is a big difference between coming to God in fear hmm, and entering his presence in confidence of his grace. Hallelujah to us. I'm not saying we sin because we want to get forgiven. But you don't have to be afraid of God. When we admit, when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice it's in the present tense. You say, oh, not me. I don't sin, Pastor. Oh, yeah. The Bible says all have sinned. You know what all means? 
It means all. There's only one person in the Word of God that did not sin. And he came here to prove something to us, too, in that respect. Say, I, it's impossible to not sin. The Bible says Jesus was tempted in every way as we are, but did not sin. He did it. And if he did it, we could aim for that too. Hmm? Can't we? Hallelujah. We read the word of God and see how more, for more than 1,200 years, the children of Israel followed rituals and followed traditions and sacrifices to atone for their sin. Their focus turned from the lawgiver to the law. Hmm. And they fell into religious bondage. Is there such a thing? Yes, there is. There's a lot of people, unfortunately, that are going to go to hell because of religion. Because they don't have a relationship with God. They have a relationship with the laws of the church. If you did this, do that. Oh, hallelujah. God continually tries to call, try to call the Israels back. You can read it in the Old Testament. Come back to me. Come back to me. Look what I did for your ancestors to himself. But they kept messing up. On purpose. Because they could sacrifice a lamb. They could sacrifice some birds. They could sacrifice something. And their sins would be covered. That's not the idea of forgiveness or confession. God was saying over and over to the game, what matters is your heart. Not your works. Not your sacrifices. Not your traditions. In the Old Testament it says obedience is better than sacrifice. It means if you obey God... You won't have to sacrifice. You won't have to confess if you don't do it. Amen? God was saying, I want you to love me. And then you will obey me. This is a great thing to learn this morning. We don't obey God because we fear him. We obey God because he loves us. And if we don't learn to love him, we'll never obey him. Let me say it again. If we don't learn to love God, we won't obey him. Hmm? Because when we do something wrong, we hurt him. Hmm? Doesn't Paul talk about, shall we sacrifice? Shall we crucify Christ anew? Listen to the words that Moses spoke to the Israelites in Deuteronomy 11.1. 1. Therefore, you shall love the Lord your God. Notice that came first. And keep his, uh, keep his charge, his statutes, his judgments, and his commandments always. How did it start out? If you love God, you will keep the rules. It's not keep the rules and then love God. Hmm? Didn't Jesus tell his disciples and us? You can read it in John 14, 15. It says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. When we break them, we're saying, even for a moment, we don't love you. Hmm? That's why God spoke about the mind. Up here is where we have most of our problems. Hmm? Our thought life. Hmm? Boy, we can make up some real doozy movies in our mind, right? God gave Israel a condition to his promise that if they obeyed him and loved him, he would bless their nation. Mm. If they learn to love God, if you love him, you respect him. If you love him, you obey him. And the land would be fruitful for them. Listen to what he says. This condition was based on love, not works, not tradition, not ritual, not religion, but love, the love of God, the love of God. Listen to God's word to the same people in Deuteronomy 11 and 13 for your notes. And it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord. Notice that's the first thing. To love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart, with all your soul. Then I will give you rain for your land in its season. The early rain and the latter rain, so you can have two harvests, that you may gather in your grain, your new wine, and your oil. And I will send 
grass in your fields for your livestock that you may eat and be filled. Our politicians need to read this. If you obey God and love him, he will bless the land. If you don't, he will curse it. Very clear. Very clear. You know the amazing thing about love and God's love? The Bible tells us not only that God loves us, but it says God is love. He is the definition of love. He loves us in spite of ourselves. Wow. God is love, and he is focused on love, not the law, not the rules. Because if you love him, you won't have to worry about the rules. You'll obey them. Hmm? Because God's people, the Israelites, found it impossible to obey the law, not just difficult, they found it impossible. It's impossible to follow all the rules if you don't love God. Hmm? In Galatians 2.16, it says, a man or woman is not justified, and that's a legal term, meaning found innocent in the courtroom. They're not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. For by works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. No flesh. Do you know it's impossible to obey God with your own willpower? How many have tried it? I'm going to stop doing this. I mean it today. I'm writing it down on the calendar, right? I'm making a New Year's resolution, whatever. For some of us, New Year's is every day. It's impossible to obey God with our will. You can do it for a while, but sooner or later you're going to trip over it. One brother once said this, living the Christian life isn't difficult, it's impossible without God's help. God not only saved us by grace, but he helps us to, to live it out. He don't leave us alone. He knows that we have this tendency to go off, mm, drift off, right? Hallelujah. There was a saying when I was in Bible school, Satan, get behind me and push. And that's what we do. Hmm? God told the people of Israel through the prophet Ezekiel, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. This is what he did for us in the new covenant. He gave us the Holy Spirit to dwell in us so that the Holy Spirit can lead and guide and teach us how to be believers. Hmm? This is what it's all about. He didn't leave us in the wind. He gave us the power and authority through the Spirit of God to win. But do we use it? Hmm? God sends his Holy Spirit in us and enables us to make that decision to say no when we need to say no and yes when we need to say yes and to obey his commands. You see, both the Old and the New Covenant are totally different. Thank God we're in the New, Te New Testament. The law said, follow the rules. You'll go to heaven. Right? Grace said, it's a free gift. It's a gift. I'm not asking you to do anything. It's a gift. If you love me, you will follow the rules. You get it? Do you get it this morning? Not about being forced to do it. You want to do it. You want to do the right thing. You want to make the right choices and so on. Hallelujah. The law says, look at your sin. Look at your shame. The law always leads us back to our past, doesn't it? We label people. One of the problems I have with, with the world's 12-step programs is they started out as a Christian thing, and it became a generic thing, higher power, right? When you go to the meetings, you hear people say, my name is John, I'm an alcoholic. My name is John, I'm a drug addict. You're never anything else. Thank God in Christ we don't say that. You can say, I used to be, but I'm not anymore. Why do we want to drag a dead body back inside and resurrect things that were trying to kill us? Hallelujah. We are saved and sanctified. 
We win if we just follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. The law says, look at your sin. Look what you are. Look what you were. You should be ashamed of it, right? Grace says, God accepts you as you are. If you've ever heard or watched or been at a Billy Graham crusade, at the end, the same song is played for the altar call. It says, just as I am, I come to thee. That's the way God wants us to come. He doesn't say, I'll cl clean up and then I'll, I'll think about it, right? No, he says, come the way you are, with your mess, with your smell, with your, 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 your terrible look, with bad breath, whatever. Come the way you are, and I'll change your life. Oh, boy, you're so quiet this morning. The law says and brings the, our consciousness of sin. We're always thinking about sin. I did sin. I got to run. I got to do something about it, right? <laughs> Grace brings us an assurance of righteousness. Grace is saying, don't do that. You'll hurt yourself. And you'll grieve the Holy Spirit. You ever think of that? The Spirit of God that dwells in us can be grieved by our foolishness. Hmm? Hmm. The law says, do it or you die. Hmm. Death penalty. Grace says, accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and ye shall live. You want to die? It's easy. But if you want to live, God is there to help you do it. Hallelujah. You see, without the blood of Jesus Christ and the grace of God, it would be impossible for us to have victory over sin. Hmm? How do you stop? I've heard people tell me, oh, for seven years I stopped drinking. All of a sudden something happened and I started all over again. Why? There was nothing inside to say, no, don't do that. You'll hurt yourself again. Hmm? In fact, the Bible says our righteousness, what we think is a good thing, our opinion is as filthy rags. You can read it in Isaiah 64, 6. Those that translated the words were very nice. But when you look at the definition of the rags, it wasn't what you dust your piano off with. It was the rags that women used to clean themselves after their cycle. It was the rags that people used when they went to the bathroom. If you had to make this a modern translation, it would say, our righteousness is like used toilet paper. That's the way God sees it. We're not going to impress God by our righteousness. All he wants is us to love him and obey him. We alone can't make mistakes and think that they're going to go away. We alone cannot make ourselves good enough to please God. Hmm? What can you do to please God? We just talked about it. Love him and obey him. That's all he asks. And everything else falls behind it. Follow me and so on. Everything falls behind that. It starts with love. You know, in a love situation, both parties have to love each other. Hmm? I was just talking to somebody recently, talking about a situation. And I said, did he really love you? Well, I thought he did. I loved him. But obviously, he didn't love her. Love has to be reciprocal. Both parties have to love each other the same. Hmm? The same with God. He loves us so much that he was willing to do all the things we talked about for us. Do we love him? Hmm? All he asks of us is, don't do drugs. Don't do this. Don't do that. Every one of the things he says no to are harmful to us in the physical realm and in the spiritual realm. My goodness. So why do we disobey? Hmm? Hmm. Here we go. All God wants from us is to surrender ourselves to Him. 
Surrender's not a nice word, is it? In the military, you don't want to say that. Surrender, no, right? I like the History Channel. I noticed one day while I was watching the very end of World War II when the Allies were storming Berlin and the German people were fighting back, young children, old men, and so on. And when they finally surrendered, those that survived, they surrendered like this. They had to surrender because they couldn't win. But there was an act of defiance. I'm surrendering, but I'm not surrendering inside, right? I'll forgive you outside, but not inside. Mm. What is it in your life, my brother and sister, that you haven't surrendered to Christ? What is it that is keeping you from getting a blessing from God? He said, if you obey me, if you surrender to me, if you love me, I'll give you everything that you need and maybe even some of our wants. What is it that you're holding on to? What is it that's keeping you from the full blessing of God? Hmm? You are the only one that can answer that. You and God. Is it worth it? Hmm? Look what the Word of God says here in John 8, 34. Whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. The more you do it, the more you can't stop doing it. How many know that? A couple of honest people in the audience. We become slaves to it. We can't stop. We're in bondage. We're, we're locked up in the sinful nature. And it says, and a slave does not abide in the house forever. In other words, you'll die that way. But a son or a daughter of the Lord Jesus Christ abides forever. Mm. And here it comes. You ready? Put your seatbelt on. Therefore, if the Son has set you free, you shall be free indeed. Do you know what that word indeed means? I didn't know. I, I worked with a guy, a cop. Well, everything was indeed, indeed, indeed. I, what, what does this word mean? How could it, everything be indeed? I looked it up a long time ago. It's an expression of surprise. Indeed. Hallelujah. You shall be free indeed. God surprises us by forgiving us and changing our lives. Oh, hallelujah. Great evangelist once said, quit trying and surrender. The reason we can't stop is because we're trying to do it, to please God. Doesn't work, does it? We have to surrender to him and say, Lord, I, I can't stop doing this. And that goes from everything to drugs and alcohol, even down to overeating. You know that's a sin? God expects us to take care of our bodies. God wants to free you. But in order for you to be set free, you have to surrender whatever it is to God. Are you hearing me? You do your little di self-diagnostic on yourself. I'm not free from this either. Not one of us in here can say we're perfect. Although I have met people that said they were. And they... They violated the word of God. If you say you have not sinned, you deceive yourself. Hmm? We need to come to God honestly and say, Lord, I have a problem, or maybe problems, plural, and I can't stop. Hmm? Could be our past. Whatever it is, stop holding on and trying to do it yourself when God says, give it to me. Doesn't he say, bring your burdens? My burden is light and easy. Give it to me, he says. I'll take care of it. But we have to let go. Hmm? I've seen people give and take it back. Give and take it back, right? I remember once when I was a child, we were at one of the evangelistic tent meetings we used to go to. Tremendous miracles. And I remember the, the evangelist prayed for a woman who was legally blind. 
And she had these thick glasses on. He took them off, and he put them on the floor. And he prayed for her, and she got healed. But as she left, she went and picked them up again. And you know what he said to her? Sister, you just lost your healing. We ask God for something. He gives it to us. We should say, indeed. I gave you a new word in your vocabulary now. Wow. God has done it because we can't do it. Hallelujah. In fact, in the 12th step, they have the saying, I can't do it. That's the first step to get help. I can't do it. He can do it. That's not enough, though. The last one is what? I am going to let him do it. Wow. That's a good formula, isn't it? I'm going to let him do it. Let me end with the words of an old song. I love the, I love the hymns because they were written by people like you and me that were in trouble, that were going through turmoil, that were going through problems. And they reached out in song and in poems as testimony to what God had done. You ready for this one? It's entitled, I Surrender All. Not some, all. What you don't surrender, the devil will use to torture you with. Hmm? Hmm? We've had a couple of, of uh, what the word was, a couple of fires here because people came and said, when I was in sin, I did all these things and I kept my souvenirs of it. What do you think I should do with them? I said, bring them or we'll burn them. What? Beautiful things. If they remind you of your sin, you don't need them. If they remind you of your past before Christ, you don't need them. You have a new future. Look forward instead of backward. All to Jesus, the song says, I surrender all. All to him I freely give. Lord, I'll give you this if you give me that. No, that doesn't work. I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. All to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit. Truly know that thou art mine. All to Jesus I surrender, Lord. I give myself to thee. Fill me with thy love and power. Let thy blessing fall on me. And then the chorus. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all.